and we are looking forward to this talk when visualization makes augmented reality. Good morning. Thank you so much for the very kind introduction. Um, I hope I can live up to the expectations. Um, going after the best paper awards is, of course, a challenge. Uh, uh, um, you have to sort of keep the interest up. Um, so today I would like to talk about uh, the time when Wins met AR. And uh, if you recognize this picture, it's from one of my fam favorite movies uh, by Rob Reiners, 1992, um, Harry and Sally. When Harry met Sally, which uh, <laughs> describes a kind of uh, complicated relationship, and this is going to be our, our theme today. Um, so, I consider myself a visualization person. I've been interested in visualization throughout my, my career, um, and I would say this is an important theme of what I do, but uh, you can guess it, there's a dark side to me, um, which is uh, which I've actually invested even more time, um, and that is augmented reality. And uh, um, augmented reality is uh, obviously an important topic now. Um, as was mentioned uh, by Bernd already, is uh, that uh, this has been going on for a long time. Um, so what you see here, uh, terrible videos, well they're actually not that terrible because I actually have them in digital form. We heard earlier today that uh, some people have to recapture their VHS tapes, so I didn't have to do that. Um, this, uh, these videos were taken with our brand new Indigo with video card in 1996. I was working for Melapogatova at that time and was somehow he had the money to buy that kind of stuff. Um, so that was pretty amazing for us, and it allows us to build the first uh, collaborative augmented reality system. And what you see here is um, work from actually one of my first publications um, in uh, IEEE Wiz 1997, together with uh, uh, the scientist formerly known as Löffelmann, today Henry Hauser. Um, and uh, it shows that in that time, 1997, you could actually um, publish an augmented reality paper at WIST. This is about visualization of, of dynamical systems. So, you know, the content is WIST, but the uh, platform is AR, which was brand new at the time. Um, let's, um, we, we didn't stick with these, uh, uh, you know, tethered contraptions. Um, a couple of years later, uh, it became possible to do that um, in uh, in a mobile context, so this is uh, uh, later work actually using uh, an evolved version of the same software uh, that was running on Windows mobile devices. Who of you remembers Windows mobile? <laughs> <laughs> running on a compact iPad with, uh, with you know, in incredible 400 megahertz. Yeah? Of course it was single core, obviously, and no GPU at all. So. Uh, um, this was the age of market tracking, as you can see, and uh, as a kid I enjoyed these Brio wooden trains. Uh, there are no trains on this, because it actually uh, all is uh, uh, running on this, uh, on this iPad. Um, and uh, we also had a collaborative version of that, of course, um, where multiple people could, uh, you know, one could be the conductor, the other the engineer, you can switch the tracks, there were two trains, you could make them collide and so on. It was a lot of fun um, showing that at, at SIGGRAPH. Um, and uh, uh, that shows that for some time, and now even on a commercial level, handheld augmented reality was uh, a very important development because handhelds are really nicely engineered mobile devices that give us all these multimedia capabilities that we need to deliver augmented reality at a very 
you know, very uh, competitive price. And this wasn't done for augmented reality, it was done for games and for Snapchat and stuff like that. Um, so uh, if, if, if you can catch the right moment in time, then of course you can introduce new uh, technologies as well. Um, now today, there's, I, I don't think there's an augmented reality paper in this year's WIS program. I did not check thoroughly, but from the uh, fast-forward session yesterday, I think there is not. Yeah? So the question is, what is the overlap today? Well, um, it is complicated. Science is usually not a simple thing. Um, but I would argue that there is a substantial overlap. So bear in mind this uh, little person thinking very hard, that's me. Um, and we will investigate now uh, what that overlap uh, actually is. So uh, in order to find that, we need to understand augmented reality a little better first. Um, so the question comes up is what, what makes augmented reality interesting? Well, augmented reality has uh, really exciting properties. Uh, the objective is to overlay the real world with computer-generated information. Actually, it could be any kind of sensory information, but we are all visual creatures here, so we'll, we'll focus on the visual for now. Uh, and that runs on augmented reality headsets, so this would be see-through head-worn displays, uh, such as the products by uh, Microsoft, Decry, Epson, Magic Leap, um, Meta, and so on, um, that, uh, that are available now. Who has tried out one, one of these headsets? So if you haven't, you should really give it a try just to understand what this kind of experience is, where we are today. It's, it's not perfect, it's actually it's far from perfect, uh, but there's a lot of progress being made, um, certainly in the area of, of displays, uh, but also on the input side. Um, handheld augmented reality I've already mentioned, of course that has the advantage today that you have a potential user base of 8 billion or so, I don't know how many smartphones there are in the world, and it's a good reason for Samsung to make some that can do augmented reality better, or Apple, and uh, uh, so there's, uh, you know, there's a, an, an innovation motor going. You can also do it with, with projectors, with projected AR. Um, that's the output side. On the input side, uh, you need uh, a 3D input, 3D tracking, obviously. Um, one of the big challenges there is uh, making the overall system latency low enough and uh, you also have to deal with this uh, blending of the graphics where you perceive the virtual and the real time, uh, the virtual and the real uh, at the same time. Um, and then we want the mobility, we want to be able to work anywhere, indoors, outdoors. This is really one factor that sets apart, apart uh, anything that is mobile from the sort of established realm of WIS, which primarily happens in an office space still, or in some, you know, uh, laboratory that, uh, that has special equipment. Uh, and finally we have this, uh, what some people call natural user interfaces. This is a very loosely defined term, but I would argue that uh, if you have this ease of use, for example, because you can move around physically and adjust your viewpoint, that is one of the defining properties of a natural user interface for me. And uh, as a result, you can get this. Uh, this runs on a HoloLens. This is actually very new work from my group. My students sent me this video yesterday night. <laughs> so uh, um, here you see a machine that is uh, superimposed with animations that show the functioning of that machine. Um, and it also has a handheld interface. And um, if you see a, a, a virtual ray for picking in the scene, just in a second you're going to see the ray again. That actually comes from the phone, that is aligned with your phone, uh, and that works by the phone tracking the HoloLens. Um, so you actually have a workspace where you can operate the phone pretty much anywhere in your you know, faulty area, um, and uh, you are not constrained to the relatively narrow field of view of what the HoloLens will give you. So the tracking goes from the phone to the HoloLens, but of course the, the display is inverted, the, the laser ray seems to be coming from your body and shown on the whole lens. 
And uh, with these kind of uh, new technologies, you know, this is a standard whole lens, and it's not a cheap piece of equipment, but it's also a standard phone. Uh, you also have the touch screen of the phone for conventional interaction. We're getting into an area that is really interesting. So, um, in other words, augmented reality seems to be coming of age. In the past, well, actually the past 20 years of my career probably, we've spent uh, dabbling with uh, sort of the low-level technologies, so I uh, did a lot of work on 3D tracking, computer vision techniques for that. We're not going to look into computer vision today. Um, in the interest of time also, because, of, because it's about the, the visual output, um, which has been relatively simplistic in the past. So with, with the augmented reality up until today, I would argue it was mostly in this realm of showing keypads, right? We all know what that means. Um, or the, the AI equivalent of keypads may be arrows pointing to a certain location in space that you should pay attention to, which is not the worst thing, you know? Uh, but it's not not as sophisticated as the kind of weird designs that we're seeing at this conference. But today, we, for the first time, we have commercial hardware and software available. So there's, of course, the HoloLens and the Meta One and so on. If you can't afford any of those, but you have a smartphone, you can run ARKit or AR Core on them, and these give a pretty good experience. These are you know, well-engineered simultaneous local localization and mapping systems. They do sensor fusion of the inertial sensors and the camera. Phones have an increasing number of cameras, which is a very rich input source. And uh, as a result, you get uh, a package where you can start doing augmented reality right away. Um, on, on a, there's a quality that, for me, was, uh, would have been a miracle 20 years ago. Uh, certainly not in a mobile phone factor, you know, with a, with a smartphone uh, device. Um, so what we can do now is we can focus on augmented reality as a new medium. And uh, a new medium that is uh, an, an interesting change of perspective where you start focusing on the what, not the how so much. And the typical uh, comparison that is often made uh, in media theory is with the establishment of moving pictures in the early 1900s, right? People, my grandmother told me when she was going to the movie theater, there was a guy explaining the silent movies <laughs> because people were not used to seeing moving pictures. Um, and uh, the first uh, sort of feature movies were more like theater plays. They were very static in their, in their uh, arrangements and only later uh, came this uh, uh, sort of uh, experience with the medium. Um, so we would like to do the same thing for any new medium, we would like to do the same thing for augmented reality, um, and uh, I personally would like to focus on Wiz in AR. And it seems to me that is very reminiscent of the evolution from computer graphics to visualization. You know, in the 1990s when I started uh, working in, in, in computer graphics, um, the Wiz was taking off, it became more independent, it was put on top. Uh, we now use established computer graphics mechanisms um, and we, we, we only build on top of that. We don't even think about uh, sort of real-time volume rendering uh, anymore, thanks to um, Jens Werk uh, and, and others, uh, but you take, it, you take it and you build on top of that. Yeah? The GPU and the algorithm for that is a given thing. Um, uh, but now we're in search of this, uh, this uh, sort of uh, media concepts, medium concepts. Uh, how does WIS fit into the augmented reality ecosystem? Um, upon closer inspection, um, you'll find out that augmented reality is not an isolated technology. It's actually part of a larger continuum that has been uh, recognized also for a long time. Uh, it's most often called the mixed reality continuum that was established by the work of uh, Paul Milgram in the early 1990s. Uh, but mixed reality describes how much of the spatial perception that one has is either real or virtual. So on the left hand side of this continuum we have 100% uh, reality, that's where we normally live. And on the right hand side we have 100% 
virtuality, or a more established term might be virtual reality. That's not the Pilgrim uses the term virtuality, so I'll say virtual reality here. And then augmented reality is sort of in the middle with an emphasis on the real world because the real world is important to us and we only add as much virtual as needed. You can also do the inverse, the augmented virtuality case, where most of your experience is virtual and only some real aspects are added to it or remain. Um, as uh, one of the examples I chose, these uh, uh, projector based installations where um, for example, at the show in the evening, you see something displayed on the facade of a building. Now, what you see is actually primarily virtual. You mostly see what is projected. You still see um, some elements of the facade, maybe the shape of structure, maybe the people around you. That remains virtual, but it's primarily uh, that remains real. But the rest is primarily virtual. Um, and that's also an interesting design point. Um, and. Uh, even though Milgram did not include virtual reality with 100% virtual into this space, this is one of the aspects that we should maybe investigate first. Because that's what many of you will know. Um, so virtual reality um, can be you know, one way of formulating what's going on there is as a pipeline. We'll look at some pipelines now to understand these uh, relationships. So in virtual reality, uh, you're rendering, you're not rendering for a conventional system, you're rendering, for example, to a head-mounted display or some sort of uh, stereoscopic uh, screen, cave, and so on. Yeah? Um, and uh, then uh, this, uh, it, this, this uh, rendering is experienced by the user, again. Um, so that's the perception part. Perception is very important because in virtual reality we try to address all aspects of human perception. Um, you have uh, focus, accommodation, vergence, uh, and uh, many other properties of the visual system that should be addressed here. You have uh, dynamic, dynamic motion, blur, and, uh, and many other aspects. And then that prompts the user into hopefully believing that there is some realism to this virtual experience and performing corresponding actions, which are picked up by sensors, primarily 3D tracking systems. Um, and these provide a continuous input to the rendering. And that's a very important distinction to a conventional, let's say, desktop system or desktop with system, where you would rather have discrete input. If you use keyboard and mouse and you're not touching keyboard and mouse, like you see, Hands free here, nothing is happening. Picture is completely static. Yeah? And with, with, with head tracking, that wouldn't happen because I can't stop moving my head unless you put me in some uh, contraption and strap me down. <laughs> um, so there's this continuous input. Um, and then the second important part is that we need a spatial model of the virtual world. But that will be mostly static. If you look at virtual reality games, the levels are still primarily static. There may be creatures running around, but for efficiency reasons, it's mostly static. Now, let's compare that with a visualization pipeline. Actually, I guess formally this is an InfoVis pipeline. Um, and there are, of course, there's again the rendering and the perception and, and the action. Um, so that remains the same. But now we have uh, three additional stages of acquisition, processing, and visual encoding. Yeah? Uh, we get, the, we get data in the acquisition, then we transform it, filter it, and, uh, and then, only then, we create a visual model, which can actually be shown. So the visual model is, or the spatial model, is created dynamically, as opposed to this vanilla virtual reality case where that is mostly not happening. Yeah? And now if we put the two of them together, we end up with a visualization that could look like this. You see, all the elements are still there. Um, first, we have the input from various sources. Then we do processing, visual encoding, and that gives us a model. And now we have the cumulative effect of the dynamic input and the, uh, the, yeah, the continuous input and the dynamic spatial model generation uh, that feed into what the user can perceive. Uh, that is often called, in this community here, immersive visualization which seems to have, a, I'm happy to see that this seems to be a renewed trend now. Um, here's see one example, this is actually on the upper right hand side a paper uh, from, from our 
Australian colleagues published at WIST last year, um, which, which is called Immersive Access, where various InfoWIST techniques can be dynamically plugged together like, like Lego pieces, and you get the uh, you get scatter block matrices and parallel coordinates and so on with a very fluent kind of manipulation. Um, so, so what is unique about this with in virtual reality is that the user perceives spatially registered visualizations, right? The visualizations are arranged somewhere in usually three-dimensional space and this, uh, this space is very carefully considered. It's much more important than conventional ways. And the spatial registration options, or the spatial registration can happen either to a physical object, if you happen to have one, or just to a physical locale, basically a coordinate system, like your origin may be in the corner of the room somewhere. Um, but you can move relative to uh, this locale. Um, and that applies to immersive risk, but I would argue that it actually goes beyond that. If you consider display ecologies, such as the tile display, this is the Graz tile display that you see here, it's also uh, about the spatial registration of information, right? I mean, uh, strictly speaking, even on my small laptop screen, I have spatial registration, a window on the left, a window on the right, but then it's kind of trivial. But here it uh, makes a difference, we all know, uh, the work of uh, Morse, Andrews, space to think, this sort of this way of thinking, this, this was what comes into play here. And you primarily see in virtual information, right? The physical aspects of that tile display are really irrelevant. And therefore we call them virtual or immersive or something like that. Uh, there's nothing in this environment that, that is important for what you're doing except for the digital information, for the data. Now, in contrast, if we go into reality, then um, the, the reality around us, of course, is important. And uh, this is because users perceive meaningful reference. A referent is a physical object or a physical locale with a meaning attached to it. It's important for us on a semantic level. Yeah? Um, now that implies that the referent must be perceivable, which then uh, uh, leads us to the notion that in an opaque VR headset where we cannot physically perceive, well at least visually perceive, uh, a, a physical referent, uh, you can't have that, hence virtual reality. Uh, but it does include all sorts of sort of uh, advanced user interface concepts such as location-based applications, tangible interfaces, Internet of Things, and so on. There's also these terms such as embodied or embedded that are sometimes used to describe this, uh, these design options. Um, just think about you checking what this guy here is doing. This is actually a random picture of the Internet. Um, of a person checking a map before entering a bus, right? So there's a little bus icon on the screen of Google Maps, which is probably that bus which the person is about to enter and they're checking whether it's the right one. Yeah? So you have visualization, I would say Google Maps is a, is a visualization tool um, that, uh, that relates to a physical referent, in this case the bus. Or you have this uh, sort of Internet of Things device uh, digital speed sign that may change over, over the course of the day. Um, and again, you see the physical sign. The referent is probably the road on which you're driving because it tells you on this road you can drive at this speed. Um, and uh, this is something we don't get in virtual reality. So a visualization that is perceived simultaneously with a referent, I would call a referenced visualization. And now, if we put the two of them together, we end up with visualization in augmented reality, um, which has been called situated visualization by White and Feiner. Um, and uh, the situated visualization puts together the reality where we have a referenced visualization, that means the user perceives a meaningful referent, and the virtual reality where we have a registered visualization where the user perceives spatial registration. And then if you put the two of them together, you have a, a reference registered and hence situated visualization. And uh, the, the nature of the reference, of course, is a key consideration in augmented reality. 
So it could be a number of things. It, with, the, with the example of the, um, the machine and the overlays of the machine, you could very well see the valve, and then the system tells you how to open that valve or something like that. Yeah? Um, a popular idea is to give a person X-ray vision, um, if we give a person superpowers, this is a recurring theme that uh, in augmented reality, the superpowers, that's probably the real reason why I chose this research. Um, and uh, for example, you can see inside objects. Uh, so in this case, this is our coffee maker, and there's instructions of how to replace the brewing uh, unit. And uh, this would then look like this. So with X-ray vision, you can look inside the object. What you see here is that this is actually a focus and context visualization. The focus is the hidden object. The context is the actual machine. And you see that the actual machine doesn't completely disappear. Um, we retain salient features of the, of the physical machine in order to, um, to let you understand what the depth, what the, what the spatial relationship is here. Uh, and this spatial relationship consideration or spatial registration is actually very important. If I showed you the same brewing group next to the machine on the left hand side, it wouldn't have the same effect. Um, and then you can have other focus and context uh, uh, elements such as this printed manual as well. So um, the referent doesn't have to be physically visible, although often it should be, because then you can immediately identify it, right? But you could say that the referent is the, is the actual machine. Um, or the referent could also be your own body. So in this study, we, we explored how the, the, the combination of a display ecology consisting of a head-mounted display and a smartwatch would work. And uh, as you can see, the touch input only works on the smartwatch, but the head-mounted display gives you a lower resolution but much wider canvas on which the information can be displayed. So all of a sudden, your smartwatch becomes kind of useful despite its tiny display, because it's, again, it's, think of it as a focus and context visualization. Yeah? Now, people in augmented reality hardly call that focus and context, but I would argue that it is. Um, here's another example um, of, of the old Studierstube work. This is a geometry education program. If any of you took uh, descriptive geometry in school, where you have to draw with pencil and paper, you know that it's oftentimes very tedious. Um, and understanding geometrical concepts, such as tangent planes here in this space, can be uh, much more um, sort of uh, intuitive, but uh, that what you can also see is that there's multiple users, right? There's a teacher with multiple students. This is the teacher, the guy in the back, this is Hannes Kaufmann, who's actually uh, also a teacher um, uh, for, for, for high school uh, mathematics and geometry, and he worked on this system with actual high school students um, who could then um, explore this space collaboratively. So, the referent, in this case, is a person, because you're explaining something to another person, right? Um, an augmented reality pipeline is required for building these, uh, these uh, systems, and it has several more steps over a, a virtual reality pipeline. It's not quite as simple. You need... Um, not only tracking of objects, but now you, or, or tracking of reference, let's say, but now you need also detection of reference, because if this is really going to scale, then you must have uh, um, object recognition such that you know what the context in that situation is. When, if, if this is, uh, if I'm working with a number of tools or documents or uh, physical objects, let's say you want to repair a machine, you need to know which each machine part is. Yeah? Uh, this is different from the kind of virtual reality setup where you have exactly two controllers and these are your tracked objects. They're always going to be two controllers. There's no doubt about it. There's no need for recognition. They have pre-allocated uh, channels. Um, but we also need to track the spatial properties of the reference. So we need detection and tracking. Um, and uh, as a consequence, the spatial model must be extended to contain both the virtual, that's what we had in virtual reality before, but also the real. We need a model of the real world, the digital twin, if you want. Um, and the spatial model is now filled with information by detection and tracking. Um, then in addition, we need 
this spatial registration, which should be given if everything is rigid and you have good tracking, but you also need to argue about the spatial relationship of objects inside, outside, the, the, the brewing group is inside the coffee machine, it's occluded by the coffee machine. These are things that concern us in augmented reality. Uh, and finally, we need to do comp compositing. Um, there's an additional step in the rendering where you need to take the, the information from the real and from the virtual and bring it together. And that, of course, requires computer graphics and image processing techniques. So we have this extended augmented reality pipeline, and now we plug our WIS pipeline into that. Uh, and don't worry, this is the last pipeline that I'm going to show you today. <laughs> and it only has seven <laughs> stages, right? So it's not like terrible. Um, but it's very interesting that uh, the situated WIS pipeline now actually uh, addresses the two properties that we have identified. The situatedness, which comes from, from reality, where we, the acquisition stage can fill a model with contextual data, maybe based on, on the detection, but maybe based on other things. You, you know, it, it tells you I'm, uh, I'm meeting Helwig, and uh, now the database looks up what Helwig has been up to in the past year. This would be the acquisition. Um, you put that in the spatial model, um, and then the processing and encoding is informed by the spatial registration. So, for example, if we find out that the person has a particular body pose and we want to show the person how to make a different body pose in some physical exercise training, we would have to construct visually code information that does that. I'm actually going to show you an example about that in, in a bit. Um, so, um, this is the, the conceptual model with which uh, I would argue we operate when we do with in AR or situated visualization. And I believe it has a lot of potential. And I'd like to show you in the remaining time one or two examples um, about uh, interesting visualization problems that uh, can be attacked in, in augmented reality. The first is about instruction generation. So the goal here is to provide uh, interactive time-varying visualizations, uh, which are triggered by what the person is doing. Um, and the second example, if there's still time, that I want to mention is about labeling. So the goal is to provide details on demand, if I speak as a visualization person, um, by supplying a real scene with labeling. Um, so this is a movie from 2012 that is sort of an artistic vision of what augmented reality could be. And it's pretty funny. It's a game, gamification kind of uh, concept. <laughs> Um, yeah, so if you make a breakfast, you can beat your high score. And, uh, yeah, yeah, it's, uh, it's fruit ninja for real. Um, and the fun part is that uh, my grad students didn't know about this video when they made this. So this is a pure coincidence. But this is an actual augmented reality system that we built, and it looks pretty much like this conceptual video, um, which was a big surprise. So what you see here is that um, a person is slicing cucumber, and uh, in order not to slice your fingers, you need to look on YouTube, this is the left, uh, left hand side inside, to learn how to do it. And uh, that is uh, augmented reality instruction generation. Our idea is that it's uh, way too uh, tedious and costly to produce everything from scratch because if you, if you look at what the industry is doing with augmented reality now is they are starting new media formats from scratch. And that's just not sustainable. And everybody who's working in computer games knows that you try to, to leverage assets. So we want to use existing sources and bring them into AR and one good source is of course videos. Um, so you've seen the cooking example. You can also take a CAD models and printed manuals, and what you see here is uh, actually an, an, an explosion diagram, which, which is actually with a live track camera. I mean, the camera is not moving here, so it looks like it's not. But uh, this is actually something that uh, is produced in real time by basically shuffling the pixels around according to a CAD model, which has been analyzed beforehand. Um, but I'd like to show you another example about uh, input from video 
about tools with surface contact. It's a little uh, of an odd phrase, but that means everything they touch a surface with a tool, such as soldering iron, brush, screwdriver, scalpel, and, and so on. Yeah? And, you, and the, the, the sort of hot spot, in the case of the soldering iron, literally the hot spot is on the surface. This is all you need to know. Um, and these activities usually require fine-grained motor skills. I, I can't solve them properly myself because I'm too clumsy. Um, so I could benefit from looking on YouTube for training videos, and we're retargeting them into uh, into an augmented reality scene, and even with a deformable workpiece. So, um, um, for example, if you want to, the, the YouTube is full with makeup tutorials. Um, and I mean, these ladies who make makeup tutorials have one million more followers than my YouTube channel. So, um, so of course, you can face track from uh, with, a, with a commercial face tracker from such a video, uh, and you basically get the deformable face model. Um, and then you can unwrap the surface pixels into a UV map of, of the face. We do we make a generic face model there. Um, so the surface is tracked and unwrapped for every frame. We know where the, where the face is. And then we can also track the tool by just tracking the tool tip and basically project, inversely projectively texture map it to get back into the UV space. And we know where on the surface that was applied. And then you can also do image differencing in the uh, in the uh, sort of undistorted uh, video frames uh, to understand what's going on there. And it works fairly nicely with, with all these things, in particular also painting, we have watercolor and we had this, uh, this uh, makeup application videos. And, uh, oh, uh, I, I wanted to mention that uh, after you track what is going on with the tool, you get, of course, a trajectory. The problem with the trajectory is that people tend to wiggle a lot. Yeah, there's a lot of noise in the input. And if you want to synthesize that into a visual encoding that is proper, such as the one on the bottom here, labeled C, um, then you need to simplify the path. So basically, you need a, a path segmentation, path cleanup stage, and then a glyph generation stage. All of these, I would argue, are with te techniques that would be common here uh, before we can display that. And then finally, oops, my, then finally my graduate student is able to prepare for Halloween properly. Um, and yes, this was a project by all male graduate students, so uh, they didn't have a lot of experience with applying makeup, um, and uh, this helped them to go. Yeah, um, same thing works for bodily motions, but of course then you need a full body tracker. So here's how that looks like. If you want to learn Schuhkraton, you're in Germany, um, then uh, you show the, the motions, and uh, user study, a user study shows that uh, if, if a person demonstrates the moves for you, it's actually not superior to showing glyphs on your own body that you can basically, um, by, by looking at the, at the augmented reality visualizations, imitate, because then it's your own, it's in your own bodily reference frame. Uh, and the spatial registration again makes makes a, a, a significant difference in, in terms of easing the learning. We've, we've, we've made a study for that. Um, okay, um, so the, another aspect is labeling. If you add the information that you have just as text or glyphs to uh, the real world scene, it can easily lead to clutter. Now, that is too much detail on demand, right? It's actually not on demand, you're overwhelmed. You would rather like something like on the right-hand side where uh, it tells you for every section of the library what's going on. Um, now, people have tried uh, that filtering uh, or, or transformation. For example, in commercial applications do it based on distance, so you end up with only a few labels uh, or distance plus some category choices. There are also more fancy algorithms, such as the one by Bell, which uh, uh, ranks objects by visibility and importance, and then fills the screen until there's too much information. So you have sort of a, 
a, a best choice, but some objects may not be represented at all. And uh, in order to counteract that, we've worked on interactive hierarchical labeling, where you do some, some instantaneous preprocessing, which can actually run at a, at a lower frame rate, uh, where you cluster similar items based on their attributes, which are, you know, this is info -based. You're talking about abstract attributes here. Our, our primary example was apartment prices and number of rooms and such stuff. Um, and um, and you, you cluster them based on the similarity to users' choices, um, and uh, you end up with a, with a tree of, uh, of objects, of clustered objects, and if you present that, um, then you can fill the screen with information that is meaningful according to what the user wanted. So, um, this would be a conventional approach, but uh, if, you, if you now unfold, unfold unconditionally, so this is cluster, but now we uncluster, and the screen is filling up. Yeah? You know, that's, that's uh, not sustainable because you end up with, with a messy situation after a while. Uh, whereas with the adaptive information density, uh, when you uncluster some stuff, other stuff that hasn't been recently visited or that is not so relevant gets condensed again. But all the information is continuously represented in some form. Um, so and you always end up with a homogeneous information density, which is kind of uh, targeted or triggered by what your current interest is. It, it adjusts to your current interest. Um, and uh, the labeling is a very popular idea, of course, because it allows you to quickly pull in uh, information into uh, existing information into augmented reality systems. So it's done a lot, but um, the labeling that you know from textbook illustrations doesn't work so nice in 3D. So here's what happens if we do this 2D labeling and we uh, at the same time move the camera, which you don't do in a textbook, of course. Uh, namely, you um, end up with, uh, wait again, uh, you end up with a lot of wiggling and uh, crossing of leader lines and so on. Um, so what can you do about that? Well, obviously you need some three-dimensional constraints. So the first thing is to bring the labels in, into 3D as uh, billboards that are always facing you, but they still have a 3D position. The leader line now becomes a pole uh, very much like these things that they put in your burgers. Um, and now we can do a constraint placement where you can slide the little label along the pole and also as long as it's touching the pole you can pan it in the image space. And then you can apply the conventional force-based labeling and you end up with a much nicer, more steady kind of visualization that, uh, that tends to also better support, at least we've informally found that, better support the spatial perception of the thing. It allows you to tie it more nicely to what it's actually referring to. So, um, these examples show us that there's a lot of, uh, of interesting areas in which we can apply with an AR, and of course, uh, this is uh, the time where this is really starting to become important. Um, many things are about to start. Um, first of all, we will get better displays. I didn't talk too much about display technology and perception today, but better displays will be coming for sure. Uh, this is actually one of the main areas where the vendors are currently uh, you know, making an effort. And we know there are technologies such as light fields or holography, which, uh, which have been demonstrated, but mostly in a sort of stationary optical workbench kind of form factor, where we can hope what uh, will actually go into a product. Um, the Magic Leap 1 even at least has two switchable display layers and, I mean, you know, there, there will be more. Uh, or I'm very confident there will be more. Um, the question is only how fast will it come. Um, so playing with these new perceptual possibilities will be an important area where I believe you will need new ideas that come from Congress. Um, then we also have this complexity aspect. It's not only the amount of labels or the amount of data points, um, it's the, the many variables that you have now that you can control, and often these are not 
this cannot be anticipated when you're writing the, the quiz program, right? The people may be doing arbitrary things. So you do a collaborative system and suddenly you have, I don't know, 1,200 collaborators in this room. Um, now that's a, that's a different situation. And that will require picking up some, some ideas from context awareness, aspect-oriented programming maybe to make that manageable. And we will also need better cognitive models because now we can no longer monopolize the user's attention, right? This is, this is not just staring at the screen and not doing anything else. You have to do this in a, an easy way where multitasking is required. Um, I've, I've talked about the, the instruction generation and you can extrapolate that there's also a content crisis upcoming. Yeah? We cannot afford manual uh, uh, curation of content in the same way we do for games. Um, so we will have to rely on external data sources of streaming data, crowdsourcing, and the WIS community has a lot of experience with that, uh, that, uh, that should be brought into this field of AR. Um, and uh, obviously, um, it's very early to talk about this. I would say we are in, a, in an adolescent stage. AR is a very young visual medium. It will take to master, to master it. Uh, but there's a very large potential uh, in particular because it allows WIS to enter real-world scenarios in mobile in a, in a very meaningful way. Um, and if you think about it, I, I would speculate that none of you has owned a Xerox Star, uh, the Dynatech, the first mobile phone, maybe some have owned a Newton, but these are all precursors of the devices that we use today, and they were sometimes 20 years before their time, and of course everybody was laughing if you were like in, in German, we say cucumber for these super, super large handsets. Uh, yeah. If you had a phone cucumber with you, I had a student who owned one, was very old. Um, and if you wear a HoloLens on the street today, you also look dorky, right? Um, but it may take decades to make mature. Um, a good indicator is the investment that has been made. So uh, you know, we all know that it was a good deal for two billions. So Magic Leap has a similar sum. Overlands reportedly or allegedly cost one billion to develop. You know, these are massive investments. They, they made them for a reason. There will be an industry behind this. Um, and this gives me hope that this will be sustainable. And then we can, um, you know, then we have a reason to work in with in AR. And uh, I think the relationship is, is not really all that complicated. Now, in this graph, there are, of course, some new hidden things. So first of all, uh, Wiz and graphics don't touch anymore, um, which wasn't true 20 years ago. Um, I, made H I, made, I made AI machine learning the biggest, but HCI the second biggest, mostly because I like the Kai community because of their encompassing nature. They accept everybody and every topic, pretty much. Um, which means you can go with your InfoWiz paper to Kai, no problem. You can go with your VR paper, or even AR paper to Kai. Um, but uh, then, then it ends with this sort of uh, uh, amalgamation. Um, and uh, you know, all of this should be, I'm, I'm not arguing that you should concentrate more, but rather everybody should expand so there's more overlap and you can learn from one another better, because that has a, a huge potential to, for radical research innovation. So, I, I was uh, at the ISMA conference in Munich last week, the Augmented Reality Symposium, and I believe the only other person who was also there is a friend in the audience. Um, so that's two of us, <laughs> and uh, 200 would be a good number, in my opinion. Uh, so please, let's interact more. And uh, with that, I would like to thank you for your attention. Questions, please go up to the microphone, tell your name and affiliation. We have 10 minutes for this. Chris? Hi, Chris Johnson, University of Utah. Dieter, thanks for a great talk. Um, in the early days of, of computer graphics hardware, which was extraordinarily expensive, um, 
everybody was looking for the, the killer app, and, uh, and you know, GPUs came along, and then they, we, we saw the gains, and uh, that that helped with the commoditization of computer like, graphics hardware, and, and the prices went down, and you know, it just exploded. And I'm, I'm wondering if you have some ideas for what the killer app is in the market. So what is the killer app for smartphones? Um, I guess we will get uh, hundreds of answers in this room because there's millions of apps, right? And AR is a medium or a platform um, that would be somehow like the smartphone. Um, you know, you carry the smartphone around, you pull it out of your pocket all day long. My daughter stares at it 20 hours a day. Um, and uh, if you had glasses that you could wear all day long and they come with information content with visualizations or maybe more, more plain things, um, then you would have this constant access that is more an experience than, than something else. I mean, apps on the smartphone are still monopolizing your attention. Here it would be more like calm computing in the sense of Mark Weiser that uh, hopefully you don't have to click a lot to, to get to the information. But the experience would be probably similar and it would be triggered by the context of the reference that I was talking about. Uh, and that could be your personal schedule, reminders for what I want to discuss with, it, with another person, interesting pieces of information related to a movie poster that I'm seeing, and so on and so forth. All right. Thank you. Okay. Further questions? Mm -hmm. uh, I'm Matt Cooper from the University of Linshipping. This sort of relates to Chris's question as well. Um, AR is not a young technology. It's 55 years old at least. Um, I've been associated with computing since 1975, and I've been seeing talks along these lines. That entire time, every few years, there's another, any minute now, it's really going to change the world. And it never does. It disappears again. And then it comes back again, and it disappears again. Why should I believe you this time? <laughs> That's a very good question, but as I said, it takes time for uh, basic enabling technologies to mature. And uh, certainly WIS was at the point uh, decades ago where it was very young and we, we all didn't know what would become of it. And certainly you couldn't buy a I mean, silicon graphics workstation for your home to run some sideways, whatever. Um, now we have all these commercial activities and uh, if Tim Cook believes that augmented reality is going to be a big thing and is betting, uh, you know, a, 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 how, may, how many ten did you figure on it, then uh, um, I have a much, I, I, I tend to agree, let's just say this. <laughs> And because you know it every moment. Thank you, Dieter, for a very nice talk. I want to learn from you about this, like the, the resource, the, the, the budget of attention that, that we have as users in, in such a context. When you show your combined pipeline, you, you have like a potentially varying data input for the visualization. You have a permanently changing condition of how you look at the thing and, and, and whatever drives your AR, VR, MR setup. Uh, have you looked deeper into what is the budget of dynamics that, that we can deal with well? And it, it appears that you have done some work on that. And I'm, I'm really curious because visualization, we know that as well. If you bring up a, a small multiple display and in, in each display you have dynamic data that is, uh, what is it? kind of rotating in 3D, then this is beyond what we can work with and uh, pay attention to. So what, what have you learned about that? Um, it's a difficult question to, to answer. Yeah? That you have characterized the problem fairly well, I guess, and, and I don't have uh, you know, a complete answer, but I would say that it very much depends on the attention. Beforehand, you have to say how much attention you're willing to dedicate. Well, if you have a, a, a heads-up display while driving a car, the amount of information that you can possibly show there is very minimal because you must not distract the user's attention from the road too much. I mean, the whole reason for putting a, a windshield display is to make it easier to transition there. Yeah? Whereas if, uh, if you replace uh, 
a, a large tile display with, uh, with a virtual display by means of, uh, of a see-through, of, of really high-quality see-through glasses, hopefully then also with the right field of view and so on. Um, the same goes for immersive visualization, and you sit in your office and you do this sort of data analysis, then you would concentrate on that. Probably reality would play less of a role there, but that is a gradual thing. And then you can probably, given sufficient display qualities, um, let the user do relatively complicated stuff. I mean, probably not more than what you can do on, on, on a desktop until we have displays that really exceed what the, what the desktop can do. Um, but, uh, but certainly, if you can, if you're in a safe environment, um, there's no physical disturbances, uh, then you can show a lot. And, and then there's anything in between, right? Uh, so if I'm having a discussion with you over coffee, we go out to one of those tables and we put our, rather than you know, unfolding our laptops, we would share some, um, some, some virtual part of the experience, uh, but nothing would get between us. And we can, for a short time, concentrate on this. There's the opportunity of, uh, of augmented reality technology that is mobile is that you have it principle always available. Um, everybody who's turning around, the, I mean, I, I guess 99% of this audience will carry some form of cell phone, right? Um, maybe 50% will carry some form of tablet uh, or laptop computer, um, and this has a larger screen, so you pull it out and you discuss something with somebody else. And uh, um, this uh, sort of uh, threshold where you can Visualize where you can invoke visual information will be lowered by these new technologies, and then the attention will be proportional to the, to the importance that you give to this. Yeah. Two more questions. Thank you. No? Yes, thank you. Jean Daniel Fizet from Korea, France. So, uh, great talk, uh, very interesting, but I would like to ask you a question. Imagine, like, in five years from now, ten years from now, we all wear. Uh, Motor reality glasses. So, what do you think are the most likely threats that we're going to have? Like advertising popping up any time in <laughs> front of you to say, "Drink that coffee, look at that microphone. This is great." Do you have any tool on that? Yeah, so, I have a Kindle, and I have to pay some extra money to get rid of the ads. Right? This mm -hmm. is a business model that people could have there too. Um, this is, I guess it's very comparable to the smartphone slash tablet uh, sort of situation. You will need to choose the right apps, you will need to choose the right content, uh, and you will have to choose how, how, to, how much time you want to spend with it. Right? Um, I, I do see a danger that if the information becomes even easier accessible, it, you know, right now I have to still pull out my phone, scan my thumbprint, call up the right app, and some people do it 20 hours a day, I'm not kidding you, staring at their phone. I wonder how they keep up with the battery. But, uh, uh, but if you have glasses and people can't even tell that you're retrieving information, uh, then the sort of uh, temptation to do it all the time and be distracted from the real world may even be larger. Um, and uh, I expect there would also be social media on, on this new kind of medium. Oh my god. On new kind of platform. Um, and that can be very addictive as well. So that is uh, a concern that I really have. Yeah. <coughs> I need a question from the second participant of the ISMA Symposium. Hey, yeah, this is uh, Michael Sigma, University of Stuttgart. You also know me. Thanks for this very nice talk. So your talk very much focused on visual encoding and how we can like get that into uh, augmented reality, but there's a second big thing in the room, the elephant, which is interaction. So, you know, at Ismar, you see people doing that all the time, and you wonder, you know, what the heck are they doing? Yes, we know it, but like, you know, there's this interactive part, so we're doing interactive data analysis a lot in this community. So maybe you can elaborate a little bit on that as well. Yeah, there's a... There was no time for, for talking extensively about this. So when, when Michael says this, this is the HoloLens click gesture, and this, for some reason, I mean, I know many people who developed the HoloLens, they didn't design this, right? They made a, a gesture detection framework, and then it was 
somebody at Microsoft wanted to make standardization, so they introduced this one gesture, and the, the regular SDK only allows you to do that in the, the, the palm gesture, something like that, which is like the first, and everybody agrees with, with that, and it doesn't work half of the time. Um, so uh, this is why we also developed this thing that I showed at the beginning with the smartphone being a second track device that you might already know it's mostly for convenience. Um, but I think uh, we've learned that touch is uh, an extremely compelling mode, and I'm now a strong believer in touch and also for augmented reality. There's, there's this myth that waving in the air, as, as uh, in the uh, Minority Report movie, is some important thing, but I don't think that will ever catch on because you also don't do it in real life, right? If you want to write something, you don't do it standing. You sit down, you choose a desk, and then the desk is your uh, passive haptic proxy, is what interaction people would say. And with the depth sensors, we can definitely do touch, and the touch interaction, I think, will be very convenient. It just has to be made more mature. I mean, capacitive touch sensing on, on smartphones and tablets is, is ubiquitous now. Um, Touch sensing with, with depth cameras is not so widespread yet, it's experimental, but I guess it's a very clear path in, in that direction. Thank you, Dieter. Yeah. Thank you.